It is my pleasure to get to introduce tonight's speaker, the National Committee uh, of the Hastings College Lecture Series. Um, was kind enough to let me do this since Joe is my former student. Um, I wanted to thank a few people tonight before we start for this inaugural Young Alumni National Speaker for the Hastings College Lecture Series. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the National Committee uh, for all their hard work with this. So if you could please stand up. They've had a, a, a long three weeks with two national speakers. So El Eleanor Reeds, Sarah Gewertz, Mark Zajac, Susan Franklin, and Ben Wethusson, uh, and then Catherine Biba uh, all put in a, an inordinate amount of work to make these, these last two events happen. This is the, the final national speaker event of, um, of the 2018-2019 school year. Um, another uh, important thank you is to Bruce Batterson and to Eric Nielsen for making sure our technology worked tonight, uh, as well as to the music department for hosting us for this speaker. Uh, it's a wonderful venue, and we're always very grateful to be able to use it. So in any case, um, without further ado, um, a number of years ago I had a young, blonde, um, somewhat impetuous student who came to me as, a, uh, as an early semester sophomore and spoke with me about, I, I think I like this marketing, digital, um, innovative atmosphere, and I'm not sure what I want to do with this. And he ended up taking a web course, and then he took more web courses, and then he took strategy courses, and he eventually became very data-oriented. He did several internships to the tune of three, and by the third one, um, he was starting to find out that people were very interested in hiring him. By May of his senior year, he'd been offered one position, had been accepted another, had been had accepted another position, and then about two-thirds of the way through finalizing that second position, a Hastings College alumni in uh, at Farm Credit Services in uh, Southern Colorado contacted Joe and said, how'd you like to come work for us? And Joe came to me and said, well, this is problematic, Brett. I've already accepted a position. And I said, that's not problematic unless you don't take the one you were just offered. To make a long story short, he took that job and Jeremy Anderson, who is in the back of the room right now, has turned into Joe's most valued mentor, um, which he could pick worse. In any case, Joe has risen stratospherically in the uh, less than two years that he's been at Farm Credit Services. Um, and that really says something for young alumni at Hastings College. I think sometimes we forget just what our alums can do very early in their career. So he's gonna come tonight and talk about exactly what it is he did to revolutionize uh, both Farm Credit Services but also to revolutionize where traditional industries are going to go in the digital age. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce a friend and a former student, Joe Brown. Thank you. So two months after I graduated from Hastings College, I walked into my first day of work at Farm Credit of Southern Colorado. We were at the Cheyenne Mountain Resort, beautiful mountain right outside of our windows. The next morning we had an all employee meeting and all of our employees from all around Colorado were there. And I walked in and I was meeting people left and right. And I sat down and this is the first hour of my professional career. This is really exciting stuff. And in the first 10 minutes, my CEO, who's now shaking his head in the back of the room, stood up in front of our entire company and said, folks, if things don't change, we might not be here. As a 21-year-old who had just moved his life to a whole new state he'd never been in, I started freaking out. <laughs> and I was thinking, this is the most coordinated hazing of a new guy I've ever seen. <laughs> 70 people are in on it, it's ridiculous. But then three hours went by and no one did a punchline. And it started really sinking in. Oh my gosh, we really are in danger of not being here. It's a really troubling thing to hear as a young person, as a new professional. And over the three hours, we started talking about why. 
And it started to come up that a year before, in October of 2017, our association went through a data breach. And as a financial institution, it's one of the most catastrophic events you can ever go through. A lot of people don't survive that. And what had happened was WordPress, which is hosting over 30% of all websites in the United States, put out an update. But one of the number one plugins on WordPress wasn't ready for that update. And hackers knew it. And they were ready for it. So when WordPress pushed that update live, thousands of websites were breached, including ours. And hundreds of thousands of records were released that shouldn't have been released. And coming into that meeting and going to Colorado, I had this really big idea of what I thought my job and my life was going to be. I thought I was going to be out in potato fields taking photos and doing videos with our customers and doing some sick tweets and, and interacting with customers every day. And that's, I, I slowly watched as that, that dream of what my job was going to be leave the room. And I realized and said that I was going to be a part of a team that was going to take us from this brink of possible extinction to hopefully a long-term success, you know, measuring what we could do along the way and become a, a company with a great reputation within the farm credit system again. And over the next six months, that's exactly what we did. And we had to answer a lot of really hard questions. How are we going to go from being over here where we don't know what our future is to being really secure with our company and where we need to be? And how did we get there? How did we repair our reputation? How did we implement digital and social media into our company? How did we save the company's marketing strategies to help our company progress? And there was a lot of things that happened within the company. We moved people into new positions. We brought in new talent. But in marketing specifically, it wasn't the social media that changed our company. And it wasn't the videos. And it wasn't the photos. It was one idea and one question that we kept asking for six months that really changed the trajectory of our department. And the one thing that we did is we implemented Agile into our marketing department. And that changed everything about my career. And it happened in the span of the first 10 minutes of my first meeting of my career. And it wasn't a horror story for long. It actually turned out to be a really great experience. But today we're going to talk about how we went from the left side, where we really didn't know what was going to happen, to being on the right side, where we're so far away from what happened with that data breach that we don't even think about it anymore, and that we're focused on other things in our business. So to start, we're really going to dive into this whole idea of what is agile, what does it mean for all of you, why does it matter if you want to go into marketing, if you want to go into finance, if you want to go into higher education, to software development, this is a, a thing that happens in a lot of industries. And it, ha it started happening in the 1990s, which is, for some of you guys, a history lesson, and for some of you, a refresher on where you were in the 1990s. I wasn't even born when this started. But what's happening in the 1990s is that developers were raising their hands and saying, what we're doing is not working in the technology world. What was, work what was happening is they were going through this process called the waterfall method which was a manager would get a, a project assigned to them. And they would put it into this huge document that was hundreds, if not thousands, of pages long. And they would pass it on to their software development team and say, go, make this happen. And this is what the waterfall looked like. Well, the develop team, development team would get this huge requirement, and they would go through a feasibility study. They would plan how, would, how they would make this software happen how they would design it, how they would build it, how they would test it, how they would put it into production, and then at the very last step, how are they going to support it? But that didn't work. The document size was taking so much time to get through that the development stages were taking way too long. These projects were way too big. They were missing their deadlines. And by the time they were done developing, the software didn't make sense anymore. In 95, they did a report that found that only 16.2% of all software projects in the United States were being completed on time and on budget. And in bigger enterprise companies, the numbers were worse, where only 9% of them were actually getting done on time and on budget. And the issues, like we talked about, was that it was taking so long to develop these big projects. They were trying to go from A to Z 
and it wasn't happening in the time span or within the budget that they were hoping. But another thing was happening. The developers weren't talking to the end users. They were so far removed from those end users that they were, they were following the instructions of what these deliverables were supposed to be, but they didn't actually apply to what the customer had originally asked for. Another 95 study of, a 30, of $37 billion worth of US Defense Department projects concluded that 46% of the systems so egregiously did not meet the real needs, although they met the specifications, that they were never successfully used, and another 20% of those projects needed extensive work to be usable. Teams were taking such a long time, and the projects were outdated and inaccurate that they were wasting money. The developers had no interaction with the customers, the industries were changing, and the companies were overspending, they were under-delivering, and they were falling behind in this race for development of new software. And so a bunch of professionals got together and said, this waterfall method isn't working, and we need to change it. So they got together and they created these six tenets of how they were gonna take on every single software idea moving forward. The tenets were transparency and visibility into their work throughout the development process. It was no longer a secret who was working on what, what was their timeline, what was their budget, and what was their goal. Early and predictable deliver delivery of small increments of work instead of one huge project that might take years to complete. The idea there is, think about the iPhone, right? And the iPhone 8 has a button, and the iPhone X, it doesn't have a button. If they just switched, they flipped the switch overnight, there would be a ton of issues for the end users, right? So what did they do? They started going A to B. Let's take away the ability to screenshot with the home button and the power button, and let's move it to the volume button and the power button. And they start incrementally taking away and testing these smaller ideas so that by the time they are implementing a new phone, there's no more button on the home, where the home button is, it's not a big deal. Predictable costs and schedule rather than ever expanding scopes and timelines, Adapt adaptation to changes in the market and business goals, a focus on higher needs and business, on user needs and business values, and higher quality products with fewer bugs and defects. At the end of the day, what they said is we're no longer gonna take on big projects, and we're no longer gonna take a year to develop one thing. What they did is they changed their mindset and saying, let's go from A to B, and B to C, and C to D, and let's start testing and retesting at every single stage so that by the time that we're done producing something, it actually is what the user wants. And so as industries started seeing the success, a lot of times they want to take over that. And that's exactly what happened in marketing in 2012. They looked at the software industry and said, why aren't we doing what they're doing? Why are we wasting so much money and time when we could be agile? And so they created six of their own tenants. Number one, responding to change over following a plan. Rapid iterations over big bang campaigns. Testing and data over opinions and conventions. Many small experiments over a few large bets. Individuals and interactions over one size fits all, which kind of hints at a customer experience. And lastly, collaboration over silos and hierarchy. And those ideas started going into all of these companies' marketing plans and how people started doing marketing and, and their planning. And that's exactly what we started doing at Farm Credit of Southern Colorado. We started asking the questions, how can we start from over here, look at everything we're doing in marketing, asking the right questions, and how can we get as far away from this data breach and reputation issues that we're having? And we did it all through these concepts of agile marketing. So for the rest of the time today, we're gonna to spend a lot of time looking at what we did at Farm Credit of Southern Colorado. And it's really important to understand that we did this in a extremely traditional industry, both in banking or finance, and then in agriculture. And both of these areas are so slow to move and to adapt to change and to turn over ideas. And yet we were saying, we're gonna do the most aggressive marketing campaign that we can and hopefully within the next six months before 2019 starts, we're gonna be chugging along and we're gonna be doing great. So we're gonna look at what was Farm Credit doing when Iowa came in, what did we implement over those six months, 
what were the results over the last year and a half that I've been there? And if there's questions at the end, we will definitely answer those. So a little bit about farm credit. We're a financial cooperative, and we provide loans and leases to farmers, ranchers, and rural Americans in Southern Colorado. We cover a little bit over 30 counties in Southern Colorado. We're a billion dollars in size. We have 70 employees, and we're headquartered in Colorado Springs. Um, as Brett alluded to in his speech, uh, Jeremy Anderson is our CEO. He's on the right side of this uh, picture. He's also in the back. He's a 2011 uh, graduate of Hastings College, or right, one, 2004. I know my boss really well. Uh, and then on the left side of this picture is Hannah Adams, who is right there, and she is a senior, and she was just our marketing uh, intern for the summer. Uh, we're very heavy uh, Hastings College in, uh, organization. But going back to this uh, story about my first day, and I didn't quit, obviously, because I'm still there, but I remember calling my dad at the first break. I ran out, there was this gorgeous mountain, and I was like, I don't care, I gotta call my dad. And I was like, Dad, I'm freaking out. There's a lot of stuff not going the way I thought it was. And being the great guy that he was, he was like, just calm down and listen to the facts. And so after that, I, I remember going back to work over the next three months, and we just started asking questions. We started dissecting absolutely everything that we were doing in marketing. Who was in charge of our website? Who had the ability to make changes to our website? Was our website even secure? Who was doing our marketing? Where was our budget going? Why were we doing these ads versus these ads? And what started to happen was, I started noticing red flag after red flag after red flag. First and foremost, when I finally got access to our website, we found out the website is still out of date and our plugins aren't being updated. Well, that's what led to our breach. Another red flag, we weren't tracking Google Analytics, so we had no idea who was using our site, for what, what were they looking at, what weren't they using. We were receiving ports, reports from our external marketing agency saying, hey, we're doing a ton of Google AdWords for you and they're going great. Well, we didn't track Google Analytics and we didn't have a website that was working properly, so I looked at the reports and they were based on impressions and not engagements. We were doing only Facebook for social media. We were spending $90,000 a year to be in 35 newspapers and only $30,000 on digital marketing. We didn't have access to our Google Analytics account or our AdWords account. Our website vendor, who we were reliant on to keep us out of trouble and to keep us in business, would not allow us access to the back end of our own site, would not allow us to change our own website, and would not provide any reports about how secure our site was. When were the malware scares, uh, scans happening? When were they updating our site? When were they checking our site? We were doing no photos and videos or graphics. We weren't tracking any ROI on the ads we were doing. We had no CRM in place. We weren't generating any leads or any new business. We weren't doing any marketing research. And the only marketing that we were really doing were four super broad campaigns, one a quarter. And it wasn't specific to operating loans or a mortgage or a land loan. It was agriculture lives here. Agriculture gets financed here. And me sitting there, I was like, okay, and then what? And there was no uh, substance to those ads. I wish that was it, but there's more. <laughs> we didn't have a social media policy. We didn't have media releases. We had no disclosures on our website or on our marketing materials, which is required by our regulator. We were overspending on print ads, underspending on digital ads. We were running outdated radio content. We weren't doing any email marketing. And we, and as a matter of fact, as a financial institution, only had 20% of all of our active customers' emails on record. A lot of issues. And my first hard lesson that I learned after about three months of being there is that companies in traditional industries are at equal, if not greater, risk by not doing marketing than by if they were doing it. And it's because they're falling into this, this thing called the traditional trap. And it's something that I have keyed. It's, they either fall into one of these four silos. Number one, we don't have the resources to allocate to marketing. Marketing doesn't actually impact our customer base. We can outsource all of our marketing to a vendor or an agency and save money, but at least we can say we have marketing. And the fourth one, which is the death of all innovation, we've always done it this way. 
And honestly, I can't count how many times in the first week that I worked at Farm Credit I heard this phrase. And it's like nails on a chalkboard. But the issues with falling into this traditional trap is first of all, you're relying on external vendors. There's no accountability for those external vendors except for, hey, we might lose their business. Vendors, because we weren't overlooking them and keeping in track of them, they were becoming a liability for us instead of empowering us. And that limited oversight allowed them to be lazy. And the examples there are, are reports we are getting from our marketing agency. The lack of security updates that we are getting on our website, even though three months ago I heard our website was one of our biggest fears. We had no update reports on the site from that vendor, and then our overarching broad campaigns with stock imagery. So we're living in one of the most beautiful states in the entire United States with potato fields, with mountains, with some of the nicest people, and our agency couldn't go out and take a photo of our customers. No offense, but like that's my dream. I would love to be in a potato field all day taking pictures. And so what we did is over the next six months, we started looking at this idea of agile marketing. You know, how can we just stop? How can we take a breath and really start looking at everything that we were doing? And remember the six tenets. Responding to change over following a plan. Well, we had a plan. We were doing four broad campaigns a year, but they weren't generating any business. Rapid iterations over big bang campaigns. We weren't even doing iterations of those designs. We had no say in what those designs were for our marketing agency. They would just send them to the newspaper. Testing and data over opinions and conven uh, conventions. We didn't even have access to our data. We weren't even collecting data which as Brett kind of pointed out to in my introduction, is my biggest pet peeve. I am a data-driven person and I think marketing without data is like driving with your eyes closed. You need data. Many small ex experiments over a few large bets. We weren't experimenting with anything. We didn't say, well, this week we put $5,000 worth of ads in 10 papers in this one specific area. What happens if we triple that? What is the ROI? What's the effect on our business if we change the amount that we spend? What happens if we don't do any advertising? Are we gonna feel it? Individuals and interactions over one size fits all. This is, again, all about the customer experience and we were guilty that we didn't have a customer experience. Last one, collaboration over silos and hierarchy. We weren't even collaborating with our vendors. We weren't holding them accountable. We were just writing them a check and saying, go. And so when we looked at all of our marketing, you look at the Google ads, you look at the Facebook ads, the ads in the 35 newspapers, the website, paying an external marketing agency, doing sponsorships, donations, giving away items, trade shows, fair shows. That zero doesn't mean what it cost us. It cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to do what was on the left. The zero means what it made us. And that brings me to one of the biggest note-taking moments that I hope you take away from this speech. It's my philosophy, it's my creed, it's my Ten Commandments. Marketing should not be an expense. And especially in a traditional industry like agriculture or like financing, that idea is either going to get you ridiculed or thrown out of a room. And I kind of was afraid both were going to happen, but they didn't. And the reason that I think that marketing should not be an expense is when you look back at all of these things that we were doing, for them to have a sum total of zero dollars gained, no new customers, no new loans, no new followers, that's not marketing. That's throwing a bucket of mud at a wall and saying, I really hope something sticks and they don't, which is Brett's favorite saying. So we did what no company wants to do. And we, in essence, turned off the switch. And that was as a result of a conversation with Jeremy and with our chief banking officer where I said, you know, I want to come in here and say that what we're doing isn't working. But what I'm really saying is that we're vulnerable. Our website is still vulnerable. We are no more safe than we were. And if that is such a big impact for us, we need to stop. And we need to take a step back 
and we need to redo some things. And so we redid everything. For six months, from June until December of 2018, we did not spend a dollar on marketing. We, in essence, shut down the website because it wasn't working. We fired our marketing agency. We fired the website host provider. We didn't run a single digital ad. We canceled all ads in 35 print newspapers. We stopped ads on seven radio stations. We didn't do a single promoted post, and that's the short list of what we didn't do. Fast forward to January 1, 2019. This is what we did do. We reduced our budget for 2019 by $130,000 and didn't feel it in marketing at all this year. We were overspending. We implemented a brand and style guide. We, imp we uh, put up a brand new fully redeveloped website. We hired a new host provider that would give us security reports and would monitor our site and help us with updates. And it was such a strong relationship that I have no fear at all in my career that our website will ever again be an issue for Farm Credit of Southern Colorado. We have a social media policy and disclosures in place, which again is required by regulation. We had a brand new brand image we implemented a CRM and we've been testing it this year. We have Google Analytics running and tracking. We're doing paid ad campaigns. We're doing SEO. We implemented Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and we're generating leads organically and through paid avenues. So for six months, what happened? It was really stressful. And there were a lot of times I'm sure Jeremy really wanted me to stop calling him and texting him like, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? But the biggest thing that we didn't do is we didn't just say, well, let's go try this. Or where are we doing social media? Where are we doing advertising? How are we doing this? And we, we started asking the one question that is the birth of all innovation and strategy. Why? It's the only question that matters when you're starting this. So we started asking, why should we have a website? Not what should be on that website. Not who should be using it? Why should we even have a website? Well, first of all, we have to. Our regulator says we have to post our financial reports, our product rates, our disclosures. Second of all, we have to connect our customers with a way to get from our website to their online banking portal so we can service their loan. We should be generating business from our website. We should be providing contact options for our customers. We should have a place that centralizes inquiries, applications for loans, and requests. And most of all, we should have one centralized place where we can tell our story. No matter if you're in the field, no matter if you're talking to another farm credit, you should say, go to aglending.com, and it'll have everything that you need to know. And this is where Agile comes in. It's not, let's go try this, let's go look into this. It's, let's go look at the data and see what the data says. So we did. Our top page that was being used on our website was the online banking page. But at the bottom of that page, we didn't have an enrollment process to get more people to be incentivized to use it. Our top search phrase was contact options, but our top bounce page was our contact page. So people were finding our page, looking at the contact form and saying, nah, not using it. Our usability was down by 10,000 users compared to previous years at the same exact time. Our product and services page wasn't being used at all. And our second top search phrase was why farm credit, and yet we didn't do a single testimonial. And then we started applying this question of why to other parts. Why should we even do social media in a traditional industry? Are farmers really looking at Twitter to find out about loans and about products? Yeah. The farm credit system as a whole was using social media to connect to customers, to politicians, and to other farm credits. It was also an avenue for us to build our reputation, which is one of our biggest goals as a, as a marketing department at that time. We wanted to generate brand awareness, and we should also be bringing in new opportunities, because we don't have to just focus on 65-year-old farmers why aren't we focusing on the younger farmers that are gonna start taking over those operations in the next five years who are on social media? Why should we have social media? Because we should be promoting everything that we're doing as a cooperative, from loans and donations to sponsorships and scholarships, and more.
And lastly, we should start implementing a customer experience that was individualized for segments of our target audience. Social media was the same exact way. We did the research. LinkedIn was being used by farm credits to post jobs. And that was it. They weren't posting testimonials. They weren't posting about other things. They were strictly trying to network with professionals to come and talk to them. Twitter was similar. It was just to talk with other farm credits. And in neither one of those scenarios was social media reaching farmers and ranchers. But Facebook was. Facebook is the top way that farm credit institutions reach their customers on social media. Lastly, Instagram and Instagram Live. Instagram is one of those um, platforms that every single future marketing person needs to be paying attention to. It is so undiscovered in the farm credit system and we're trying to implement it and the National Farm Credit Instagram actually started using it to Instagram Live political events with our senators and with governors so that we can start raising awareness because I don't know if you guys paid attention, but the farm bill this last year took a really long time to get reapproved in Washington. And it came up with this problem of, we don't know if our politicians that are representing us are actually seeing how important that is. So they started using Instagram to connect our customers to our politicians. Last example. Uh, why should we even be doing digital media? And if you were watching the screen of the, of the slideshow that was up when you came in, some of these facts were going across. Four times as many people want to watch a video over reading about a new product or service. 82% of consumer traffic by 2021 is going to be video. Competition in industries are allocating 75% of their budget to digital over traditional uh, industries. Content with relevant images get 94% more views. Content marketing costs 62% less than traditional marketing and generates three times as many leads. And the most important one, you can track your return on investment. And we started as a department with our CEO, with our chief banking officer, with important people within the company, we started asking all of these questions. Why are we doing newspaper ads? Why are we doing radio ads? Why are we using an external marketing agency? Why aren't we doing testimonials? Why are we spending three times as much on print marketing than we are on digital marketing when the industry is trending in the exact opposite way? So what did we do? We looked at Agile and we started making actionable changes. We implemented chat on the website. We're the first farm credit in the entire industry out of 70 farm credits to implement chat on our website. We redeveloped our contact form with half the fields so that people would be more incentivized to use it. We streamlined the requests for donations and sponsorships with an automated form so people didn't have to come into our, our branches anymore. They could just go to our website and fill it out. We launched an online application, which is one of the first online applications in the farm credit system in our district for our rural home loan product, so that people could, un they could choose which experience they wanted to have. Should I go to our loan officer, Lance, and get an application and talk to him? Or if I'm antisocial, should I go to the website and just fill out an online application? We redeveloped our products and services page, and it's now the second most used page on our website. We added an enrollment form for online banking on the online banking page. We reduced all of the content down into important pages, and we added testimonials to the front page as a landing page. Same idea with social media. We looked at the data, we saw where the opportunities were, and we utilized that data to make decisions. So we started posting all of our open jobs on LinkedIn, and that's misleading because in the age of agile, we actually started doing it on Facebook too, and that quickly got turned off because we were overwhelmed. We were posting for a chief information security officer job and getting someone who was a felon and also who had worked with dogs their entire life applying for a chief level job. We are like, this isn't gonna work, we better take that off. Rapid iterations over Big Bang campaigns, it works. We started a tradition because our CEO really values an experience for our employees. And we started doing red carpet welcomes for every single new employee. And if you follow Hannah on social media, she had one as an intern. We roll out a carpet, people line it, you get a round of applause and free breakfast, it's the best. Um, we participated in farm credit 
competitions to raise awareness for 4-H and FFA and to raise awareness of issues within our industry. And we promoted every single thing that we did as a cooperative, every donation, every scholarship, and every sponsorship. On digital media, we created new video testimonials of customers telling their story of farm credit. We stopped using stock photos. We have not used a stock photo in a year and a half. We live in the most beautiful state next to Nebraska. <laughs> Go Big Red. Uh, we live in one of the most beautiful states in the United States. There's no excuse that we can't go out and take photos of our customers and start showing the people that we're proud to finance. One of the biggest things that we did is we increased the percent of all emails for customers on record from 20% to 80% in two months. Because we incentivize people with food, it works. And so when you look at agile marketing, these six tenants, responding to change over following a plan. We weren't doing big bang campaigns anymore because we realized we have no idea what's gonna happen in the third quarter that changes the entire plan for the fourth quarter. Right now, the Fed is dropping its interest rate continuously. We had planned an entire campaign in advance for our trust fund account. And yet, when the Fed dropped its rate, our rate was no longer competitive and we had wasted a lot of time figuring out who should we be targeting what was the mailer gonna look like? What was the email gonna look like? We couldn't use any of it because we planned too far in advance. We stopped doing big bang campaigns. Rapid iterations over big bang campaigns. The rapid iteration part. We started looking at our ads and saying, what if we highlighted an operating loan in this part of our territory this week? And in that same exact part of our territory, what if we highlighted a land loan? What was gonna get us more inquiries? Testing and data over opinions and conventions. This idea that we've always done it. So what did we do? We, we didn't do a single ad in 35 newspapers and we still don't do any ads in newspapers. And we didn't feel it at all. The, the, the many small experiments over a few large bets. The newspaper is an example. But the experiment of chat was an, it was an experiment for us. If people don't want to fill out a form, what do they feel about a chat? Is that more personalized for them? Are they more incentivized to use those? Individuals and interactions over one size fits all. We started segmenting our content and our marketing towards very specific people. Well, these 35 to 45 year olds who've never been in agriculture probably don't need the same content as people who've been in farming for 65 years and understand how a loan works and collaboration over silos and hierarchy. We started holding our vendors accountable. So then we get to this overall topic today of how should you be implementing agile and digital and social media into these really traditional settings? And the first thing is you have to stop falling into the traditional trap. You can't keep saying, well, we've always done it this way. That's not an acceptable way of looking at things. Hastings College is one of the best examples to look at. Why do we need to change? Because we've always been, do been doing everything the same. So what are we gonna do? Textbooks are expensive. Let's see what we can do with technology. Our experience for the, the student it maybe not, might not be that great. So what do they do? They implement traveling for all second year students. It's really stressful to take on a lot of classes. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna do block scheduling. Challenge the way that you've always done it. Because you might say it's always happened this way, it's always worked this way, but your competition is innovating around you and leaving you in the dust. Number two, stop looking at marketing as a year-long campaign and start segmenting. When I was in school, I was like, I don't know how to do a major campaign. I don't know how to make it last a year. I don't know how to make that successful. Well, good news, I didn't have to do it because that's not how marketing works. You should start looking at things in chunks of weeks, in chunks of days. Don't use the same content on every outlet. Focus and understand on your audience and every outlet has a specific purpose and if you don't understand that, you're gonna be left in the dust. What we did was a mistake and we failed in the beginning because I was posting the same content on LinkedIn as I was on Twitter, as I was on Facebook, as I was on Instagram and let me tell you the engagement rates were terrible. LinkedIn is not a place to be posting about 
a corn farmer who's really grateful for his operating loan. Facebook isn't a great place to post about an open accountant position. You have to start tailoring your content. Number four, don't ask what the platforms are that you're supposed to implement. You should be asking, why should we be implementing these things? Go back to the very basic question. Why should we have a website? Why should we have digital media? Why should we have social media? And start working down. Look at your data, learn from it, test it, and repeat it over and over and over again. It's cyclical. You might solve this problem for this specific product, but you're gonna have to keep doing it for every single product and service that you offer. Never fail in the same way twice. We haven't because we're still in business. Enough said. <laughs> Number seven, quantify your goals, celebrate your successes, and dissect your failures. Your successes are less important than your failures. You should always understand what went wrong and why and how you can quantify it and how you should go back and fix it. If you fail twice, first of all, you're being lazy because there's more data now than there's ever been in the history of the world. Second of all, it's not hard to take in some of the data that is provided. Never fail in the same way twice. Utilize your data and learn from your mistakes. And the last thing that I will say about how you're supposed to be implementing these ideas is keep the customer at the cusp and at the front of everything that you're doing. If Hastings College didn't ask students what was important to them, maybe some of these changes wouldn't have been so successful. Regardless of how you feel now, it's amazing that you get the opportunities to have the experience outside of a country that you get to start implementing technology instead of paying $400 for a biology book. It's, an, it's amazing that you have these opportunities to spend more times in one class than you have to juggle seven classes. The student was at the forefront of a lot of the innovation that Hastings College did because they said, we're not close to a big city, we want to attract more people, but one of the great ways that we can do that is we can start creating an amazing experience for students. We did the same thing. We looked at our customers and said, what, is the, what are the things that we could start implementing to create a better customer experience? And we developed around those. None of this matters if it didn't work, right? I could be just talking and talking, and if it doesn't work, who cares? But we've seen a return on our investment in about nine or 10 months that make these ideas work. First of all, we generated $30 million in new loan inquiries from our website this year. We closed just under $4 million in new business after not closing a loan in history from our website. We've done that in nine months. We made $110,000 in interest revenue off of those loans this year, and we made $175,000 on those same loans for next year, which by the way, in our projected budget, would cover our entire marketing budget for next year we would not be in an expense. We reduced our budget by $130,000 last year for this year, and we're gonna reduce it again by $25,000 this year for next year. We were recognized with seven international marketing awards. We now close 20% of all online inquiries that are eligible into new loans and closed customers. 20% for an engagement and close rate, conversion rate, in your first nine months of doing something, not bad, but that means that 80% of what we get is really terrible. And you have to train people to say, you have to take the unqualified and look at what the qualified has done. And to create a pipeline of $30 million, yeah, I get some jokes from some of the loan officers, but we still work together because it changes the way that they're doing their job. We, this year, have the most amount of people using our website than we've ever had in the history of our company. We've had 200 chats in the last nine months, and we've had 100 people send us contact forms where in previous years they weren't using the contact form at all. And the coolest thing that has happened in my career so far, in my long, long, illustrious career of two years, our reputation has gotten so solid as a voice of um, credibility within our marketing 
that other farm credits and other associations within the farm credit system have said, why don't you go do a project for us? Why don't you start helping us with our marketing? That's a pretty cool thing. For, the, for those of you that are students in the, in the audience, these are my pieces of advice for you. First of all, you're probably not gonna learn about Agile in college. It's a really advanced idea. But if you can start learning about it now and graduate from Hastings College with an understanding that marketing is changing and this is why, and go to your first job interview and say, this is what you're doing and this is what you should be doing, you'll get a job. Brett alluded to the fact, I wasn't gonna talk about it, but it's okay. Uh, I accepted a different job out of college. I spent five months interviewing for a UX engineering position with a company in Lincoln. And in my first interview, they said, what are we really bad at? And I was prepared to tell them, you're not bad at anything, you guys are great. However, have you thought about this? And that turned into a second interview, and a third interview, and a fourth interview, and a fifth interview, and it really hurt to drive to Lincoln that many times because I was a poor college student, but I got a job offer because I understood this, this movement towards agile. The second thing, is start asking why. It's one of the most important questions that we have today because it's the start of all strategy, the start of all innovation, and it will get you to where you need to go. It, it's no longer okay to say how or where or what should we be doing. Why should we be doing something? And if you can get that to click in your brain, and if you can get that to be how you think about strategy, you will be light years ahead of people that go to surrounding colleges like Doan or something like that. <laughs> the last thing that I would say, Hastings College is an amazing place, and it gives you guys opportunities that you wouldn't normally have in your life. One of the few opportunities that I had was to do glass blowing and computer science, and also to be a cheerleader at this school. They all taught me about problems that I'd never had before. How am I supposed to handle molten glass and not die, and yet still make a cup that I can get a grade for? How can I go through computer science and look at a language I didn't understand at all, and get a good grade and pass that class so I could progress in my web communication design classes? How could I work with females in a way that addresses issues today with communication and with working towards a common goal? And a lot of those things happened because I took chances and opportunities that this college had for me. And you guys are all in a really great position that you can do that right now. Go take glass blowing. If you don't have to take computer science, that's okay, don't do computer science, but there are other opportunities here that won't make you lose your hair. But at the end of the day, Hastings College provided me with a lot of information and a lot of ideas that I could then go into the real world and be successful with. So when my CEO stood up in front of my company and said, things have to change, I didn't necess necessarily know how things were gonna change or what we were gonna do to make things change, but I definitely understood how to ask the question of why. And that is my biggest takeaway for you. Start asking the question, why? Thank you. I'm getting, what did you say? Are there any questions? Can we leave? I get it. A lost opportunity, right? It's always the fear. If we're not doing something, our competitors are probably doing something, right? Well, in all of our time, we had no processes in place to show that even when we were doing marketing that we were getting those opportunities. 
And so we, we had nothing in place to track. What were our closed loans that we were getting because of marketing? What, what were we doing to enhance our business because of what we were doing in marketing? And so for me, it was a really easy thing to say, well, clearly we're not doing anything that's meaningful. Obviously, I'll backtrack and say we were doing a lot of really great things. We just maybe weren't as strategic. But I think that the biggest risk for me is that FOMO, fear of missing out on opportunities. And I just didn't think, and the data wasn't showing that we were doing anything to get those opportunities anyways. And so why not take that opportunity to step back and then re-enter the market in a short amount of time, which six months in the real world, I see as a very short amount of time. But now, if we were to turn off our marketing, we would be losing millions of dollars worth of opportunities. And so that's kind of how we mitigated that risk. Such a good question. All of us in this room that are still students and that are young professionals are part of this millennial age group, right? And we all are up against this stigma that we're entitled and that we ask too many questions and that we just want things immediately. And that was something that I never felt at Farm Credit because I had the support of a really great CEO. And I'm not just saying that because he's here. I would say that if he wasn't here too. But the, the idea of why is not asking a question just to ask a question. You have to come from it from a really good place and say, let's take example our website. Why are we using a vendor who isn't keeping us secure? Do we understand the risk that that's putting us in? Do we understand we're still vulnerable? It's not, well, why'd you use that color? Why'd you post that photo? Why are you doing a story on that customer? Because that stuff is pesky and that does kind of get annoying. But if you're asking questions that have to do with strategy and that have to come from a good place and you're asking because you actually genuinely care, that's one thing. The other thing that I will say is asking why too many times to the wrong people is a good thing. Because it shows you who is the right person to have in your company and who is not. And we. And, and to have in the right roles. And it's a really hard lesson to learn in the real world as a 21 year old that maybe I need to stop asking that person and I need to start going to that person. Not because I wasn't getting the answers that I wanted, but because I wasn't getting answers at all. I don't know if I answered your question at all. I'll just tell you, find a good boss. Um, it's one of the reasons I took this job is because I knew I was going to be able to ask questions. And I knew that at my other job, I was just going to be a part of a really big company. And I didn't think I was going to matter there. But at my job now, I'm trusted and I'm able to do what I want to do for our company. And I'm able to empower our company in the way that I want. And it's all because I found a good boss to work for. And I guess that's my biggest advice to you is no matter where you work, you have to work in a, a place that is willing to change and that is willing to listen to you ask, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? Yeah, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing. If you go back, good lord, that's a lot of slides. You guys did great. If you go back to these overall principles of Agile, and you're looking at point number, <laughs> where does it say data? Number three, testing and data over opinions and conventions. I think that really makes you start asking the question of why. You know, why were we doing newspaper ads? Why? Why aren't we doing pa newspaper ads? And when you have data, it becomes really easy to say, 
well, if we got $2 million from a newspaper ad in this paper, that's why we're doing newspaper ads. And it's not always gonna be the answer you want, but data, it's so hard to argue against. And data is scary because for people, data is either gonna prove that they're right or that they're wrong. And the thing about being wrong in business is that it's fine as long as you don't do it twice. Being scared of data to me is um, more of a fear of their job than of the strategy. Because a lot of people can make careers off of being wrong for a really long time. But when you start looking at data, and when you start depending on data, and when you start relying on your decisions based on data, it takes a lot of the risk out of it, and a lot of the fear out of making those really big decisions. Because data is so hard to argue against. As long as it's from a good place, it's you know, it, it's a credible source. You can't be afraid of data if you're gonna use it to make a good decision or just to make a decision because it's hard to argue against data. Data is your best friend, for sure. <laughs>